have to fear is in war. Fear there is no substitute for victory. Let us never negotiate out of fear. We stand undivided, forever united, fighting hand in hand for the liberty we burn, for glory and honor for our sons and daughters, ever mindful of the lessons we've learned. Let the torch of freedom burn. Welcome to Wobblers Live. This is the intersection of faith and politics. Thank you for joining us today. Visit us online at wobblers.com and wobblerslive.com. There at our Wobblers Live radio site, you can get a list of all of our stations around the country we can be heard on. And also you can find out about some of our past programs. We have archive sections there with lots of programs from the last few months, including our Good News Fridays, our Foundations of Freedom Thursday. You might want to get involved in some of those talks about the Constitution and the Declaration and our founding principles. And maybe you have some questions you would like us to cover on those Foundations of Freedom Thursdays. You can uh, get those questions answered by sending in your question to radio at wallbuilders.com. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer that. Maybe it's about a founding father or about some of the principles uh, that the nation was founded upon. Or it could be about some of the things happening right now in our nation and how the founders might have responded to that. Almost every issue we face today, in principle, they faced in one way, shape, or form. And it's great to be able to go back to that history and look at how they responded to those things. So today we are finishing up a three-part series with a guy named George Barna. If you're not familiar with Mr. Barna, you ought to check out his website, barna.org. That's B-A-R-N-A dot org. Phenomenal researcher, wealth of information there on his website. Uh, This is the third part in a three-part series. So yesterday and the day before, we heard from George Barna. He was speaking at the Pro-Family Legislators Conference that's that chance once a year for us to get together with state reps and senators from around the nation and and uh, just exchange ideas and hear from some great speakers, George Barna being one of those. And he shared uh, incredible information, some of it shocking, some of it very concerning in terms of the culture and where the young people are, are right now and, and the thinking of, of our current generation even uh, of, of just a lack of biblical worldview. And, and he talked about some of the things that we need to do to turn that around. So it's a, it's a great presentation. We wanted to share it with you, our listeners, here on Wobblers Live. If you missed those first two parts in this series, you can get them on our website right now at wallbuilderslive.com. And after today, you can take all three parts and uh, share them with your friends and family. It's great information. I hope that you'll share it with the folks in your life. Uh, let's go back to the Pro Family Legislators Conference. We're going to get the conclusion of the presentation from George Barna. When we look at how... The various facets of the Christian population voted. It was overwhelmingly Republican among the white evangelical or born-again people, again, self-identified. Eight out of ten of their votes went to Republicans. Among white Protestants overall, seven out of ten among Protestants in general. Six out of ten among Catholics, about 55 percent. But here's the thing that, that actually you're the first people in the world to see this. I haven't put this out yet, but... Uh, when we look to turnout among Christians, it's, it's a bit of a disturbing picture to me. Nationally, the turnout was a drop-off of about 8 million votes from the 2010 level. And when we look at the Christian population, uh, the, uh, and by that I mean this uh, self-identified evangelical and born-again population, the vote dropped by about 1.1 million voters. Now, I have to tell you, there was a concerted effort that was going on. David was involved in it. Uh, We've been involved in it in a number of different uh, places, working with more than 100 different organizations to try to get the Christian population to take this responsibility seriously. It's an uphill sell. And, I mean, what we saw is the drop-off wasn't as bad as the national average. Nationally, it was about an 8.8% decline. Among the evangelical or born-again population, it was, quote-unquote, only a 5.2% decline. But what we want to see are those numbers going up. Now, why didn't that happen? Part of the reason is because churches continue to distance themselves from the electoral process. We tried to work hard with theologically conservative pastors this past cycle to get them to understand that they have the right, politically or legally, And they have the responsibility, biblically, to educate their people and to motivate their people to take that responsibility seriously. 
And we did see some churches that are taking it more seriously than they have in the past. But when you look at the big picture, the needle didn't move very much. And so, you know, uh, we're almost at a loss as to what to do with the group. I think that we've got to, to take a serious look at what can we do to get conservative Christians out. We cannot necessarily rely on churches to motivate them to do so. We're going to have to have messages that resonate with them at a different level. We can also, I think, uh, just by way of kind of winding up some of what I want to say here, uh, a couple of big points, some reflections. One is that, again, we didn't win. We were very fortunate this time that the Democrats were willing to lose by virtue of, of how they've behaved in office over the last few years. But the big question to conservatives, the big question to Republicans across the country is, so what is your vision? This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. How should we respond if confronted with frustration and conflict? The proper response was given over 200 years ago in a lengthy speech when Benjamin Franklin told the delegates at the Constitutional Convention, in this situation of this assembly, groping as it were in the dark to find political truth, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine we no longer need his assistance? God governs in the affairs of men. I therefore move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. Benjamin Franklin knew that prayer was the proper response. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Being against the sitting party and its leader is not a vision. That's a tactic. And that's okay, but that's not going to do it. And so we have to understand what is the vision, and then what is the message or the series of messages that emanate from that particular vision. High turnout is going to happen in 2016, and we know that right away that means we have very little margin for error. We've got to be much smarter than we were this time. We've got to use our resources much better. When we talk about the spending of resources, I was kind of shocked when I looked at the numbers of what proportion of spending was devoted to television advertising. Television advertising tends to be very, very expensive for the bang that you're getting for it these days. We've got to be much more personalized and customized in our communications, we have the technological means to do so. And I'd suggest that it's important that we realize that what I'm sensing out of the data is that with each coming election, there's a new mindset the voters are embracing. And it, it, it's what I'm calling this zero-based voting mindset. Zero-based meaning that they go back to square one each election to figure out which rascals am I going to get behind. They're all rascals. That's what they're thinking. So if I've got to pick one, which is the least of the evils that I can choose from? But there's not nearly as much loyalty as we might hope uh, there would be or expect that there would be. So we have to think about voters in that light. And toward that end, the ability to build cooperation around all of the people that are in our camp, so to speak, is going to be crucial. The one thing that I really applaud Democrats for is they play well together. And when I look at the Republicans and all the different organizations that are raising money and that are putting out messages and that are uh, trying to educate people, they're so worried about their turf. It's kind of like working with the church all over again where each church, and I've been doing that for 30-some years, it's so frustrating 
that, that, that churches don't realize, but wait, we're all part of the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter whether they come to my church, your church. What matters is that they're part of the kingdom of God. Well, politically, the Republican Party reflects that same kind of thinking where the different entities that are out there representing the views and the candidates emanating from the party are so stuck on, but I want to get the credit. I want, the, I want to be the one in the limelight and all of that. Democrats don't have that same problem. Most of the most influential democratic organizations are completely unknown to the American people, but they have dramatic influence because they work in tandem with their partners on the same side of the fence. They don't care who gets the credit. They laugh all the way to the Congress. They laugh all the way to the, you know, wherever it is that they, they're, they're trying to get to. And so the more that as a leader in the party, you can talk to these different organizations and encourage them to work with their brethren who are, are, are fighting the same fight that we're fighting, the better off we're all going to be. Another thing that I think is important is to recognize that a lot of the, the perspective that Americans have today, when they think about the key issues and they think about what Republicans stand for and what Democrats stand for, they have assumptions. Many of their assumptions are not right. And so we can't just give in. We've got to rethink. So how do we communicate a, from a different approach more effectively? Why is it that that they generally, initially, swoon for the Democratic or the liberal point of view. Again, because churches have not been doing their job of helping people to develop a biblical worldview. Families have not been helping their kids to be raised with a biblical worldview. And so therefore, they fall for the, the, the most fun, the most alluring, the most attractive argument that they hear from a more charismatic personality. And that's the basis on which voting takes place. So again, as you're thinking about as a leader, as someone with influence, what can I do? Think about the whole issue of worldview and, and how you can affect that. Think about what is the simplest form of the message that I can communicate that will resonate with people's felt needs. Do you know what their felt needs are? And do you know how to make these issues simple? Because I can guarantee you, having studied these uh, you know, voters for years now, they're looking for the simplest message. They're not going to devote a lot of time to studying ACA. They're not going to devote a lot of time to our military budget. They're not going to devote a lot of time to almost anything that you can name other than what's my tax rate. They'll, they'll devote some time to that. So you've got to figure out, how do I simplify this? And realize that even if you have all the facts and you've got a, an ironclad, watertight philosophy that you can explain to people, they don't think philosophically. They think, if you will, emotionally. And so you've got to be able to communicate through stories as much as, if not more than, through philosophy. Voters are becoming less and less engaged, and this is where I'm really hoping that you can begin to make a difference. They're becoming less engaged because they're losing faith in the system. They're losing hope in America itself. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Often today, it seems that the federal government has become too intrusive into local matters and federal micromanagement has now unfortunately become the norm in education, law enforcement, religious expressions, and even on what is and is not moral. Strikingly, the Founding Fathers had intended that the federal government never intrude into any of these issues. As Thomas Jefferson explained, taking from the states the moral rule of their citizens and subordinating it to the federal government would break up the foundations of the Union. I believe the states can best govern our home concerns and the federal government our foreign ones. According to Thomas Jefferson, the original plan was for the federal government to direct foreign affairs, but for the states and local communities to direct the domestic and the moral ones. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD.
And this is a, a very serious situation. What does it mean that they're losing hope? I mean, there are a lot of different things that we can look at, but uh, three out of four Americans already admit that the morals and values of the country are on the decline. Seven out of ten uh, voters believe that if the signers of the Declaration of Independence were alive today, they'd be disappointed in what America has become. Two out of three of them say that their children are going to grow up to be worse than, than uh, the life that they had. Uh, six out of ten of them believe that it's now impossible to achieve the American dream. A majority of them say uh, the United States is no longer a place where anybody who works hard can get ahead. This is not a place that excites people. We look uh, you know, at, at uh, religion and we find that almost three out of four people say that even religion is losing its influence on society. You look at, at their perspectives on governance and what's happening there. Almost nine out of ten say that congressmen, congress people are more interested in serving special interests than in serving the voters who put them into that office. Uh, two out of three say that they believe most congressmen would trade their votes for more cash or contributions. Two out of three say that they're usually disappointed by the candidates they support. Half of them say that if you took a random group of people right out of the phone book and put them in Congress, they'd perform better than the current Congress. Three out of ten believe that their current, only three out of ten believe that their current congressman has similar ideological views to them. Uh, only 8% say that the ethical standards of top officials in the administration are excellent, and just 4% have a great deal of confidence in the people who run our government. You look at their concerns about the government itself, the process. Three out of four say they're dissatisfied with how we're being governed. Two out of three believe that the government will never improve. Six out of ten say that the federal government has too much power. A majority say it's trying to do too much. Check this out. Half of them believe that the federal government poses an immediate threat to the rights and freedoms of ordinary citizens. And by the way, it just so happens, I think they're probably right. <laughs> but this is something to build on. I mean, the idea of showing you these statistics is to, is to, is to build in your head an understanding of where these people are coming from and what kind of threads you can begin to pull on to grab their attention. Because simply capturing their attention is so blasted difficult. So you've got to speak to the things that they already resonate with so that they begin to trust you. See, uh, you look at the fact that three out of four say that the United States is more divided than at any previous time during their lifetime. And, and why is that? Well, it's because the media drives that division because they know the controversy sells. That's what brings an audience. They want that division, and they pretty much control people's sense of reality. Politicians exploit the division because they know that that's something that gives them attention and perhaps opportunities. People are just coming to accept the division. That's just the way it is. It's beyond their control. Churches are essentially ignoring the division because they don't want to dirty their hands with politics. They're doing a holy thing. And then you look at the fact that, you know, two-thirds of Americans say that America is in a state of decline. And when we break that down, uh, you know, I could give you reams of numbers, but the basis of it is they think that families are struggling spiritually, we're losing it, churches aren't helping, the political system's floundering, the government is unproductive and ineffective, the economy is uh, still not strong, they're not sure it's going to recover. And they feel that it's a lot harder to be optimistic about the future. And so what we've got is a nation of people who do not and feel they cannot trust their political leaders and institutions. We've got a nation filled with people who cannot and do not trust the media at the same time that they keep tuning in, they keep reading, they keep going back to it and say, yeah, well, what's new then? They cannot and do not trust their friends because they think their friends are just as ill-informed as they are. And they cannot and do not trust their spiritual leaders. And how can they? Those people have been spiritually or, or uh, essentially silent during this whole process. And so what I want to suggest to you is that it's, and, and this is really the cornerstone of the book that David and I wrote that, that they gave you, U-Turn, is that when you try to figure out what made America uniquely great and powerful and sustainable, when you compare it to all the countries of the world, over the last four or five hundred years. I'd suggest that it was that partnership that developed between church, family, and government. 
and, and where they work hand in hand toward a shared vision. And the problem that we face now is that, yes, we've still got those three institutions in place, but they no longer work hand in hand. There's no shared vision, and there really is a failure of leadership in all three of those. What do you do as leaders? It's very simple. You motivate, you mobilize, you resource, and you direct people toward a shared vision. But that definition of leadership implies that, first of all, you have a sense of vision, and that, secondly, you can effectively get people to understand it and to own it along with you. And until you can get that to happen, we're going to continue to have this nation of people that are at odds with themselves. And so I don't, I don't know how you won, why you won. I mean, the neat thing is that most of you won. But recognize that that's tactics. That's winning elections. That's really different from leading people. And so now the incredibly hard part, you thought the election was tough? I mean, you know, those of you who are incumbents, you know this. You know how hard it is to lead people with the many different things pulling at you from umpteen different directions and the media beating you up no matter what you do. But you've got to have that, that sense of vision at the center of what you're doing and to do everything you can to get people to buy it. What's going to facilitate that? This is, out of, again, out of a survey I haven't released yet. But what we discovered is that when we asked people last week, so what is it that you're going to be looking for in your leaders in the next election? What we found is that there were two things that an overwhelming majority of people said are extremely important as they assess the candidates. Now, this isn't any big surprise, but it's important to keep in mind. Number one is that they want people who they sense are honest and trustworthy. Because right now they have a system filled with people where they neither trust the system nor trust the people. Hey, this is Tim Barton with Wall Builders. And as you've had the opportunity to listen to Wall Builders Live, you've probably heard the wealth of information about our nation, about our spiritual heritage, about the religious liberties, about all the things that makes America exceptional. And you might be thinking, as incredible as this information is, I wish there was a way that I could get one of the Wall Builders guys to come to my area and share with my group, whether it be a church, whether it be a Christian school or public school or some political event or activity. If you're interested in having a Wall Builder speaker come to your area, you can get on our website at www.wallbuilders.com and there's a tab for scheduling and if you'll click on that tab you'll notice there's a list of information from speakers bios to events that are already going on and there's a section where you can request an event to bring this information about who we are where we came from our religious liberties and freedoms go to the wall builders website and bring a speaker to your area If you can do things day after day after day that communicate to them, we may not agree, but you can always trust that I'm going to try to do the right thing and I will be straightforward with you about why, the what and the why. And secondly, they're looking for individuals who are strong, competent leaders. Not people who just like to be in the newspaper, not people who just, you know, park it after they get elected but people who really want to make a positive difference in the world through what they can do in that position. The more that you can communicate and, and demonstrate, even more than communicate that to them, the better off you're going to be. You know, in the end, I, I would say that as a leader, you may not be the absolute best, but you can be great. You may not be the answer to all needs, but you can satisfy some needs. You will not understand everything, but you can understand enough to do what you need to do. You can't change everything, but you can change something. You're not going to make the world a perfect place, but you can certainly leave it a better place. And ultimately, the charge to you from the people is to be the best leader that you can be. you got to ask yourself, what's the alternative? 
That is your job description. Be the best leader you can be. I hope by understanding something about the mindset and the heart set of Americans and thinking through what a leader does with that kind of information, you'll be able to take us to a place we've never been before. Thanks so much for listening. God bless all of you. Well, thank you to George Barna for speaking at the Pro Family Legislators Conference. Thank you for listening today. I hope that you've learned as much as we did. That was just so much good information there. And some of it may have really bothered you. You may be as concerned as, as we are, but I hope that it, it, it motivates you to get involved and make a difference, to do more to preserve this way of life that we love. It's going to take all of us getting involved. It's going to take us uh, thinking in, uh, generationally, thinking about our children and grandchildren, thinking about how to influence our current generation and the future generations and, and how to do these things wisely. Just It doesn't happen by accident, folks. We've got to have some good strategy and uh, that's why George Barna is just great to have him as a friend of the show and to the Pro Family Legislators Conference. And we appreciate him speaking at the conference, helping to equip and, and encourage and educate those legislators, but also for us being able to air this here on Wall Builders Live and, and do the same for you, our listeners. And uh, we want to encourage you to visit his website at Barna.org, B-A-R-N-A dot org. Barna.org. We'll have a link today at wallbuilderslive.com to make it easy for you. We appreciate you listening. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. We stand on this.